do something I don't normally do. I'm going to use the amplified version for reading the text. And I think it will become apparent why once we get into that. But turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. It says, therefore I tell you, now if you were following along in the King James Version, the next three words would say, take no thought. But a lot of times we skip right over that, take no thought. And I just thought this, this is really what I want to focus on today. Therefore I tell you, stop being worried or anxious, perpetually uneasy and distracted. Anybody hearing what I'm talking about today? About your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body as to what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? There's one to say, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow seed nor reap the harvest nor gather the crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you by worrying can add one hour to the length of his life. A lot of people are trying to do that, aren't they? Where was I? Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory and splendor dressed dressed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive and green today, and tomorrow is cut and thrown as fuel into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith. I'm glad he didn't say no faith. He said little faith. And then he's going to say it again. Therefore, do not worry or be anxious, perpetually uneasy and distracted, saying, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? For the pagan Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. And here it is again. Say it with me. But do not worry. For your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first and most importantly, seek. I want you to aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness. His way of doing and being right and the attitude and character of God. And then all these things will be given to you also. One more verse. For the fourth time, he says, so do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So with the help of the Lord today, I'm going to preach on a subject I've entitled The Ancient Antidote for a Modern Malady. The ancient antidote for a modern malady. What I really want to say is I think God has the answer for this modern problem that is affecting all of us. Can we pray? Jesus, I love you and I thank you today because you are an ever-present help. You're our strength and you're our rock and you're a God that does not fail. I know, Lord, today that you have a purpose, God, in this service. And I pray that you would anoint, Lord, me to speak your word. God, let it go for its intended purpose and let it be today, God, a word that doesn't fail, Lord, to bring forth the fruit that you want. I know, Lord, that you're able to edify, build up, and strengthen your people. Give us understanding, God, that we're not ignorant, God, of the devices that are placed against us in this day. But, God, we give you the praise, and we give you the glory, and I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, God, today that we're a victorious church. Thank you, Lord, today that we have hope and it's all in you. You're a good God, and I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Anxiety. Stress, worry, words that do not appear in the King James Version of the Bible. I want you to think about that for a minute. Anxiety wasn't even a word in the English language until the 1500s. Worry in its modern context wasn't even utilized until 1804. But they're terms and emotions that I think we can all agree they're, they're common with our society. 
And I think it's safe to say that in 2020, the COVID pandemic, if anything, introduced a whole new level of fear and anxiety in our, in our world. The World Health Organization issued a scientific brief that reported a 25% increase of 76 million new cases of anxiety disorders because of the onset of the pandemic. It's a global mental health crisis. And you know which country leads the whole world in being the most anxious? If you said the best country in the world, the United States of America, you got it right again. Nearly one in five Americans, 42.5 million adults suffer from some kind of measurable anxiety disorder. One in five. And those are the ones that are reported like that. Anxiety is the most common type of psychiatric problem facing Americans today. And it's not limited to any age demographic. It affects our youth as well as the adults. And this won't come to the surprise of anybody that works with youth. It's actually most common. It's the, high, the highest rate of this disorder is between the demographic of 12 to 29 year olds. Why are we so anxious? What are we worrying about? You know, I would think that if there's anybody that should be anxious in this entire world, it would be those maybe in a third world country where they're struggling to obtain food and clothing and shelter. Countries like Ethiopia and Afghanistan and countries that war where the bullets are flying and where the bombs are dropping. But the World Health Organization reports lower levels of anxiety in those countries than right here in the United States. I don't, I think I, I, you, it resonates with you and I, I'm not telling you guys something that you don't know about. We're a nation that's beset with anxiety and worry and it actually affects more than just that 20% of a population. If we're really honest, it affects a whole lot of us. In fact, it, this is something that is pretty safe. It's almost 100%. In one way or another, we all suffer a little bit with worrying and anxiety. I may not get an amen, but I still think it's true. <laughs> so I'm asking you today, why are we so anxious? What are you worrying about? What's causing you to be consumed with worry and stress? And what's keeping you up late at night? I know, sometimes you ask those questions and you get in trouble because I might have to line up a whole lot of counseling ses sessions right after this because, you know, why do I worry? You know, I think we could say I worry because I'm a parent in a mixed up world and my child's influenced by ideologies and forces that even when I was growing up, they didn't have to deal with. I'm worried because I, there's a housing situation and I have to know how to deal with that housing situation and I don't have an answer right now. And I'm worried because my income isn't keeping up with all the expenses because inflation is just every time I go to the store and every time I go to the gas station, it's more. You know, I'm worried because just down the road in East Palestine, there is a train derailment. And now we're thinking about how that affects our water and our air and our soil. And I'm worried because someone that I that I love is 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 in pain and, and maybe even looking at dementia. And I, I don't know how to deal with those issues. I'm worried because. I'm in chronic pain and I've been dealing with it and I don't know how much longer and it, it seems like it's making things worse in my life. And the list goes on of why we're worried and it's all legitimate, isn't it? I'm not belittling any of those. I'm really not. But in our text, Jesus was speaking and he asked, first of all, he asked, why do you worry? And then I don't know if you, I kind of pointed it out, but four times he tells us not to worry. I don't think he really was just telling us. I kind of look at this as a command. I don't think he was saying, well, I, I know that life can be hard, but it would be a good idea if you didn't get too stressed out. I, I, it, that wasn't the way it came across to me. I don't think he said, let me offer a suggestion for a better life. You should try to not let the things of this life quite bother you quite that much. Everybody has struggles. Just do your best and don't get too worked up. No, I think the same God that said thou shalt not covet, the same God that said thou shalt not kill, the same God that said 
that commanded you not to have any other gods before me, that God robed himself in flesh, and four times he emphatically commanded us not to worry, to not be anxious. You know, I, I have to admit, I, I don't like it when a person walks up to me and says, oh, don't worry, you know. You, you just lost your job, and they're, oh, don't worry about it. You, you'll find another one. Everything's going to be, you know, you, you don't really understand what I'm going through. You know, you, you know I'm, I'm, I get, get that doctor's report, and it doesn't seem to be quite the good report I wanted. Oh, don't worry. You know, I, I've, I've had worse things happen. You're going to get by. You know, you got a family member that's sick. Oh, don't worry. They're, they're going to be okay. God's got all that. Just trust him. You know, somehow or another, the, the words don't quite ring with that same Feeling. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? But let me remind you, this is God manifested in the flesh, and he has the power to see the end from the beginning. He's not only the alpha and the beginning, but he also said that he's the omega and he is the end. And he's the God that understands the situation better than we do. And he's the one that said, don't worry. This is the one who said, let not your heart be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am... I'm leaving, and, I, and in the future, I'm going to be there. There you may be also, because he's a God that transcends time. This is the one that's telling us when you get to the end, I'm not only going to be there, but I've already been there, and I've made things all right for you. This is the one that's telling us, do not worry. And this is the one that rode himself in flesh, and as a man, he told us not to worry, and then he demonstrated what that looks like when you don't worry. You all know the story. It's the boat. It's, an, it's on the Sea of Galilee, and it's the middle of the storm. And the disciples, to be quite honest, they're freaking out. To be quite honest, there's so much, much anxiety that, that they don't even know what to do. And finally they go and they begin to look for Jesus, and they find him, and they, they ask him this, don't you even care? Here we are, we're entirely stressed out, and don't you even care? And I can't say that I blame them. Because they find him, he's fast asleep in the bottom of the boat, and he's like a man who just bought a new mattress from Brother Jeff, you know, and he's telling us just how good and how wonderful that is, and he's sawing logs, and he's getting that extra hour of beauty sleep, and they're stressing out, and everything in life is going crazy, and he's a man with no worries, and that's when he looks at those anxious, stressed out disciples, and he uses that same phrase that we just read in Matthew chapter 6, O ye of little faith why did they have little faith i believe it was because the anxiety because the fear because the worry it robbed them of their ability to have great faith they were so distracted with everything else going on that they forgot who they were really in the presence of jesus said do not worry but what is worry i told you i had to switch to an amplified version because that word that we use all the time isn't even in the king james version but we can go back to the Greek of that word that is in, in the Bible, and that word is the Greek word merimneo. Now, I don't speak Greek, so I'll probably butcher it real bad, but it's a, it's a compound word. It's a noose, which means the mind. That shouldn't surprise any of you. When we're talking about worry, it's going to be in the mind. And then the verb that it tells you what that mind is doing is the word marizo. It means to distract. It means to divide. It means to draw in different directions. So what we're saying, we're, say, we're talking about worrying, is we're talking about how that your mind is distracted, how your mind is drawn in different directions, how your mind is actually split. When, when you're worried or, or anxious, our mind is divided. That's not the way we look at it. We, mul we multitask so well in our society, or at least we think we do, Actually, those that study it say you really just jump from one thing to another as fast as you can. And really all that does is add stress and worry and anxiety to our world as well. But to be worried or anxious is to have a mind that is not functioning as a whole. I want you to think about that. Because we accept being worried as being a natural state. But actually our brain is literally impaired. And you know if your brain is impaired, there's going to be some problems with that. You ever been behind someone who's driving with a divided mind? Yeah. It wasn't necessarily the gift of discernment, but the powers of suspicion confirmed when they sat through that second green light, and yeah, they were probably texting, and their mind was divided. 
where it's early in the morning and the lady in front of you, she's meandering aimlessly between both lanes on, on State Route 11. And you finally get a chance and you accelerate past it and as you look, she's putting on her face. Now you all know that's scary for two reasons. But it doesn't put you in the best frame of mind for the rest of the day because I'm talking about a divided mind and it's dangerous to drive when you're divided but it's also dangerous to live with a divided mind. And I'm not talking about just dangerous as far as physically, not just mentally, but I'm talking about spiritually. It's dangerous for us, the people of God, to have a divided mind. When I worry, it impairs my prayer life. When I worry, it distracts me from my Bible study. When I worry, it keeps me from hearing the voice of God. When I worry, it affects my ability to preach effectively. When we worry, it, impair, it affects our ability to really deal with all the spiritual warfare that, that we're facing today. It affects our ability to witness to a world that needs to see hope and faith demonstrated in a life. When we worry, it affects our faith and it keeps our witnessing of miracles that God wants to see in our midst because we are no longer having great faith, but now we have little faith. I don't want a divided mind to keep someone from receiving their healing at Point of Mercy Sanctuary. I don't want a divided mind to keep somebody from receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost at Point of Mercy Sanctuary. I don't want a divided mind. We come in here and we worship God, but I don't want it to be to where I'm thinking about it for a little bit or even while the service is going on, my mind is so scattered that I can't. You know, the Bible says that where two or three are gathered together. He said if two or three of us will just come together together, that's when he's going to achieve great things. And sometimes it's that divided mind that keeps God from doing great things. I don't want to just have where we walk out and we say we had good church. I want to come into the place and we walk out and say, surely the presence of the Lord was in that place. And he has done great things. Not because of who we are, but because of what he changes lives. We can come in here and we can say, yep, we had good church and walk back out and worry the same way we did before. But I don't think that's really the will of God for our lives. Jesus said, do not worry or be anxious. When we worry, part of our brain fights against the other part of the brain. That's really what's happening. We want to think one thing, but really we start to think of other things. You know, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest. I have to tell you, when I worry, a lot of those times afterward, I look and I realize that what I was worrying about wasn't true and it wasn't honest. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. Think about the, what, the good report. And that's not what worrying. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, that's what we're commanded to think on. And it's hard to think on those things when our mind is filled with doubt. It's hard to think on those things when all we see is anxiety and fear and all the negative things that is going to take place in our life. I'm talking about a malady that affects every part of our society, and it can affect the church. And I don't believe that's the will of God. David said, oh, magnify not the things of this world, but magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I'm supposed to magnify the Lord. I'm not supposed to magnify the problem. Because the problem's always going to be there. But if I get the magnification right, I really understand where the answer is at. And it's in that precious name of Jesus Christ. The problem is with worry isn't that you don't have a vision. It's that you have a vision without faith. Let me say that again. The problem with worry is you still have a vision. You still have a nightmare. Because you have a vision without faith. You imagine the worst instead of imagining the best. You know what the difference is? Worry fails to include God in the calculations. I'm not saying that we don't have bad situations. I'm not saying that there isn't situations in our life that we, we don't have problems. I'm, I'm not saying that, that when somebody is sick that we, we just discount that situation. I'm not saying that you, we don't have financial issues to deal with in life. Jesus even said that tribulation was going to come. He promised us that. We understand that we're in this world, but I'm telling you somehow, if we can focus on something other than the worry, then I think that we can be victorious in this world. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm tired of living a life that's divided and distracted and drawn every which way but the way it needs to be. 
So I, I'm trying to look and what can I do and what can we do? And maybe this is just teaching more than preaching, but this is a question I think we all need to ask ourselves. It's, it's a real easy question, but when your mind gets impaired, sometimes you better start with something pretty easy. Is that all right? Yeah. This question is so easy, you're going to say, why are you even asking it? My question to you is, is there a God? Pretty basic question, right? Whatever you're going through today, if you're facing sickness and the doctor's report doesn't look good, I just have a question for you. Is there a God? Your relationship is on that rock and you're looking at this week, you're going to have to have that meeting and there's situations that's going to take place. But is there a God still that's in control of that situation? You've done everything that you know how to do and the job situation isn't getting any better. But is there a God? You have more bills than you have resources. But is there still a God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills? I have a question for you. Is there a God or are you alone in this world? Are you alone in this world? Are you facing these problems all by yourself? Are you totally unsupported? Is everything depending on you? Is everything dependent on your finances? Is everything depending on your talent and your ability? Are you alone or is there a God? When you look into the stormy darkness of, of that storm in your life, do you just see the storm? Or do you recognize that there's a creator that was able to say, let there be light? When your body is racked with pain and it's ravaged by sickness and it's, it's dark and there's no one else around and it's the middle of the night and you've been dealing with it for more days than anybody else really knows about, do you only see frailty and failure? Or can you say like David it said in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Is there a God? And do you know that God? Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves that there is a God, and that he's not just any God, but he's a good God. He's the kind of God that would create a world, and he would say, I'm not just going to leave it and leave it off to its own self. But I'm a God that cares about what's going on in that world. He's involved with his creation. He cares about us. He cares about not only the big things, but he cares about the littlest things. Let me ask you, what is your God like? Is he a big God? Or is he just a little God that you call on every once in a while? Is he capable? Is he intelligent? Can he manage his affairs in all of this universe? And if he can, do you think he can manage your affairs? Is he reliable? You know, he's a God that is a God that loves us. No, he's a God that the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. He's not just a God that loves us, but he is a God and he is love. You know, sometimes we forget just how powerful that is. But this is the same God that robed himself in flesh. The demonstration of his love is on Calvary itself. John wrote in 1 John 3, 16, hereby we perceive the love of Christ. We just begin to understand because he laid down his life for us. You know, sometimes that Calvary story gets a little bit messed up too. I hate to say it, but have you ever heard the story like this? God made man. Man sinned. Sin had to be punished. So God, the angry father, vented his wrath on Jesus his son for us, so that we could have help. And then Jesus, the son, was slaughtered by a raging father so we don't have to deal with the penalty of sin. And now we have the opportunity to hang out with that slaughtered, beaten, mangled son. And he says, you can be a son just like that. I don't know about you, but that isn't my idea of a loving God. That isn't my idea of a God because, what, you know, we're, we're oneness. And so we, I think we can understand a little bit more a second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19 to wit that God was in Christ he didn't send somebody else he was there himself that's why my Bible Jesus said Philip have I been so long time with me, you and yet you haven't known me oh come on I'm talking to the church has he been so long time with us and yet we haven't known him he said he that's seen me has seen the father he's the one that said I and my father are one. He's the God that is the loving God, and he's a God that cares about your situation and my situation. He's that kind of a father that can be there in every situation. What's your relationship like with him? He's so many things, but Brother Rick, you mentioned it. He's a father. He's a father that knows our needs before we ever ask. 
Now, there's a lot of fathers in this world that aren't good fathers anymore. And there's a lot of people that don't really understand about that. You know, Jesus even addressed that. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, he said, If ye then being evil, he was talking about fathers. He said, human fathers. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask him? He said, even those of you that are messed up in your failures, you can still care and love your children. But he's saying, you don't even understand how much your heavenly father loves you. That's the... I'm, I'm asking, why are you worried? I'm asking, why do you forget that there's a God? And why do you forget that there's a God that loves you? Jesus said, you know, that I'm a father that loves you. We have some pretty good fathers in this church. We have some pretty, pretty awesome fathers in this church. If, 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 you, if your dad is, is going to this church, I think, I think you're blessed. We got some pretty good fathers. We even got a... Father that's stepping up and doing it twice with Brother brother Mike. Brother Mike, how would you feel if you went to the store and as you go to the store with your kids, they start saying, please feed me today. Please don't starve me today. I'm so thirsty. Can, can I get just a little drink of water sometime today? You'd look at them like they were crazy, right? And then if they say, don't, don't leave me in the store. Don't, don't, leave, don't leave me outside in the cold, but can I please come home with you today? You'd think there's something wrong with that relationship. And Mike, would, he'd be going, you know, let, let's hush this up. You're embarrassing me. But sometimes that's the way we look at our Heavenly Father. Sometimes it really is. Let me tell you, he has the whole world in the palm of his hands. And when we worry and we say, what's going on with all these situations? He's saying, I'm such a powerful God, and don't you think I... You know, Brother Mike isn't going to do everything for those kids that they want. He's not going to give them candy 24-7 because he knows it's not good for them. And sometimes we want God to do things. We want him to do it our way. But let me tell you, he's a very present help in the time of trouble. We're living in a world that's filled with anxiety and worry. But God said, do not worry. There's a mighty God who's in control of every situation. He's a loving father, and he's working all things together for good. And that's his part of the relationship with you and with me. But we have a responsibility as well. We have to understand that I have an obligation to respond to that relationship. So in closing, let me remind you there's two sides to every relationship. We've talked about how God relates to us. But now I really want to focus on how we relate to God. Several years ago, I don't know, several years ago, out of the blue, I started having problems with blood pressure. Some of you have blood pressure problems. You know what I'm talking about. I'd never had problems with that before. I've, I've always had good health, and this came up on me all of a sudden. I just started feeling off, and I didn't know what it was. I finally went and got blood pressure checked and ended up going to the doctor. And they, they do what all the good doctors do. They gave me some medicine. And... To be perfectly honest, the medicine was awful. I ended up, I was, a, I was about passing out at work. My wife was driving out to Ivy Tech trying to see what was going on, and, and it, 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 my blood pressure would shoot up, and it would drop down. And so, like good doctors, I went back, and they gave me another form of medicine because that's what they do, you know. And, and that seemed to work a little bit better, but now I started having chest pains and shooting pains and numbness in, in my arms and and. I'd wake up with cold sweats, and I went to the doctor, and they said, well, it sounds like you have some cardiovascular issues, so they scheduled me for a bunch of tests. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm not the first person this has happened to, but I have to tell you, I was frustrated, I was nervous, and I was anxious. And it wasn't because of my blood. It was because of everything that was taking place that I didn't understand. Now, it wasn't that I was af af afraid of dying. I don't know about you, but I'm not really afraid of dying. I'm looking forward to that time when I get to spend eternity with God. And when I don't have this body anymore, but I can really get deeper into his presence and spend more time with him and know him in a way that I've never known. But at the same time, I didn't want to leave my wife and I didn't want to leave my kids. And I felt a responsibility as a human father to be there. 
And then I had that other concern of, well, what if I do have a stroke or what if, you know, I do have something major with my heart and I, I'm no longer able to provide. And that bothered me and it bothered me enough to where I was staying up at night and I was, I was, I was, I was praying. I was praying fervently. I said, God, I know that you can heal me. And God, I believe that you're a healer. And God, you've healed me before. And God, it's by your stripes that, that we're healed. And, and God, if you would just heal me today, that would be so amazing. And, and I'd have another one of those attacks. And I'd say, God, I still know that you're able to do this. And God, I'm still believing you. God, but whatever happens, don't, don't let anything bad happen to me. Because God, I, I'm, I'm doing your work. And so God, as long as I'm doing your work, surely, you know, you, you're going to take care of me. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? We kind of begin to bargain with God a little bit, don't we? And that's exactly what I was doing. And, and then one day I just kind of gave up and I said, God, you know what I want. God, you know my fears. And God, you know every part of this situation. And you know exactly how I would work it out if I could fix it. But I can't fix it. And God, you're able to heal me. And I know that you love me. But I'm not asking you to do it my way anymore. I'm just asking you to do it your way. I'm not in control, and I'm not going to worry about being in control, but God, if, if, if whatever you want. And I said, God, way back, way back when I first felt that great power of the Holy Ghost in my life, it was because I said, God, whatever you want with my life, and whatever you want to do, it's not my life anymore, but it's your life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I said, God, I'm, not, I'm putting all this in your hand. In my life, it's not my own, but I belong to you. And whatever, whatever you want to do, you go ahead and do it. And that was when the chest pain stopped. That was when I started sleeping better at night. I went for all the tests, and even before I tell you, you know the tests all came back negative because God's a good God. But really what I want you to understand is that other part of the relationship with our Heavenly Father requires us to submit to his will. You want to know what the real antidote is for anxiety? It's submission. It's recognizing that there is a God and that I'm not in control. It's recognizing that he's a good God. And then it's saying, God, it isn't going to be my way. God, it doesn't have to be my way. God, I know what I would do, but I'm not as smart as you, and I, I'm not as powerful as you. And God, whatever you want, that's really what I want. Jesus said, do not worry or be anxious. He said it four times. He said, your father knows what you need. And then he wrapped it all up in verse 33. He said, but first and most important, what you really need to do is just seek, aim at, and strive for his kingdom and his righteousness. What he's really saying, just aim at doing it his way and doing it the right way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because we don't do it that way. And that's why this world, and that's why each and every one of us are fighting with worry and with anxiety and with stress. And then he wraps it all up. He says, and that's when all these things are going to be given to you. And all those things that you're worrying about, you don't really have to worry about. And he goes on and he says, it's not just those things that are you're worrying about today, but don't worry about tomorrow either. Isn't it amazing how the people of God, we can say, God, I trust you entirely with making sure that I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to spend eternity with you. And I can trust you with my, my eternal hopes forever. But when it comes to what I'm going to do today and the situation that I'm facing today, somehow we become those of little faith. You know what I'm talking about? I'm looking at some people. And this is a message for you today. You're going through some things. And the simple message is just this. It's just time to put it back in his hands. And it's just time one more time to say, God, I'm going to trust you. And God, I, I may just have a little bit of faith, but somehow I'm just going to reach out to you. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and the praise singers to come at this time. There's a God that loves you. And we so often just want to do it all ourselves. But I'm wondering if today 
someone would just say, you know what, I've been doing it my way and all I have is stress and anxiety and it's not getting any better. But I just want to come to the front. Physically what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm leaving everything right here and I'm going to cast all my cares on you, Jesus, because I know that you care for me. Some of you have been going through some situations and, and you don't even, you don't even, it's just common, it, you felt that pressure for so long. And you say, I can deal with it. I can deal with it a little bit longer. But today, God is saying, yeah, you can. But with that distracted mind, there's so many other things that you're missing out on. I'm wondering, are you willing to say, I, I want your will and not my will? God, I don't understand today and I definitely don't understand tomorrow. But God, I'll just put it all in your hands. Are you willing to say, Lord, I'm your servant? If it's good for your kingdom, then that's what I want. If you're going through a storm right now, and I would say that based on the fact that we're in the United States of America, there's some people that are anxious and worried right here today. You've been trying to trust God, but that worry keeps coming back. And so I just want to invite you now. Just come and just say, God, I'm giving it to you. And God, I'm going to put it all in your hands. And tomorrow, God, when it, it comes back up again, I'm going to put it back in your hands. And the next time, I'm going to remember that you're a good God. So I, I think it's good if all of us just come to the front. And all I want you to do, I, I, this is a different message. I've never tried to preach anything like this before. But I want you to understand that God wants to do some things in our midst that as long as we're distracted, it's never going to achieve the purpose that he wants in our midst.